It's Frankenstein. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome everybody to my kitchen here on a Thursday night. And I can only thank everybody so much for being kind enough to uh, be here on a Thursday. I mean, I can see we've got uh, 22 people for a starter. And that's uh, not a bad start at all. So, uh, again, this is obviously a day late from Cast Iron Wednesday. And that's why, thank you very much, you know, because uh, it, I'm hoping I'm not interrupting your schedule with this. But, well, uh, folks, we know that uh, it was uh, postponed this week largely because I went on a road trip yesterday. And I've already posted the uh, results of that road trip on YouTube because, yes, I did, in fact, go on a, um, on a, to a book signing uh, last night for uh, where I got to meet Max Miller from uh, Tasting History. And, yes, uh, the, uh, re the actual event itself was a lot of fun. Uh, even brief as it was, I uh, really enjoyed it, and I'm certainly glad I went. The road trip itself, the actual driving there was, uh, well, not the best in that it was very boring, which I guess is good in its own way. But also, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I tried to make a couple of detours to, uh, do, uh, you know, to uh, find a couple of things to do, but uh, neither of them turned out uh, anywhere. But we'll get into that in another time. Thank you so much, though, for being here for tonight. Uh, because, yes, indeed, we are going to be doing some uh, cauldron conjuring in the kitchen uh, once again with a uh, cast iron cauldron. This one here is going to be a uh, five-quart Dutch oven from Lodge Cast Iron, in fact. So, uh, but uh, what can we say, you know, because... At, I mean, I suppose, if nothing else, I mean, that's what the title of this uh, video is supposed to be, because, you know, here we are. I was working in the laboratory Thursday night when my eyes beheld a wonderful sight, a cast iron cauldron that puts us in the mood to open it up and do some chopping and fill it with food. So we'll do the mash. We'll do the monster mash. Yes, indeed. That is uh, what we're going to be making tonight. Uh, essentially, I also call it extreme mashed potatoes because that's really what it is. Essentially, we've got mashed potatoes and, and we are going to be throwing in some uh, extra stuff to go with it. Some cabbage, some spinach, uh, an onion also, and uh, a lot of... Uh, Sausage has got to go into this as well. So, yes, indeed, because this is indeed Col Cannon, an Irish dish that uh, is actually quite popular around this time of year. However, I should indeed say hi to uh, everyone. Yes, Elsie's cat, it's going to be mashed potatoes. Um, hello to uh, all the people who have been kind enough to show up here. Hello, Jim F. I'm fairly new here. I have a quick question. I removed a skillet from my lie tank. And the pan has dark staining in spots. Anything I can do to remove the stains? Um, for instances like that, in a lot of cases, I just season over them myself and it works just fine. But if you really want to uh, get down to those stains, you may have to go for something like perhaps electrolysis if, if they're that extreme. Or you could even try soaking it in vinegar for maybe a couple of hours or so and see if that helps to uh, remove it. And then give it a good scrubbing with Barkeeper's Friend. That's really the best I could say about those stains. But in general, as I said, I've just seasoned over them. And, it, and uh, in most instances, I haven't had a problem with that. And it certainly helps. And I certainly hope that helps. But yes, hello as well to JIR Finishes and Mike Washburn, Rick Stumbaugh. And hello, Val's Black Cats Rules and Clico, Alma Wasilewski, Pat Z, all the familiar faces. And I'm, again, very glad to see you folks here tonight. Uh, I should really start getting started with some uh, chopping here because we are indeed going to be doing some food prep. But uh, we will uh, get on with it uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, besides, we do have some things to talk about as well because I'm sure folks want to uh, know about um, you know, the, uh, the road trip yesterday. But there's a little bit more that uh, will be going on as well. You know, uh, because... Uh, I only I only saw a couple of hours ago, and in fact, I posted this on Facebook, but have not had a chance yet on YouTube. Um, it seems that um, Stargazer Cast Iron 
they posted a video on TikTok today uh, in which they described their new process for producing their uh, cast iron pans. And it seems that they are going to be going the same route that um, Fields uh, cast iron has been going, namely that uh, they are indeed still producing their pans with a nice smooth surface, but after they uh, polish their pans to a mirror finish, they are then going to add a little bit of texture to those pans. They are, uh, in the case of Stargazer, they're calling it micro texturing, which means that if you, uh, which means that the pans are going to look uh, like they have a smooth finish, but if you actually run your finger over the surface, as I found out with the, with the field skillet that was I was kind enough to receive, that they, in fact the uh, it does not have that mirror smooth glass like icy finish that you might expect from a cast iron pan, um, namely because that is meant to hold on to the seasoning. And I was surprised to find that, but I actually liked it with the field pan. And likewise, uh, it seems that Stargazer is going the same route as well. Hello, right Trump's policy. Well, thank you very much. And Debbie, me neither. Just cook them and they'll go away with time. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Max Miller, he's a very nice person. I mean, granted, I only had a little time to say hi. You know, we couldn't have a real conversation or anything. But, yeah, he does seem like a very nice and very down-to-earth person, which I thought was uh, really, uh, yeah, was really nice because, you know, um, he has, of course, um, he used to be a... Uh, Disney employee, and he actually left his job at Disney to uh, do uh, his uh, YouTube channel full time, and he's been a, a great success. And it's always nice to know when this happens to someone who really deserves it, namely a nice person. Uh, but anyway, this is a modern lodge uh, five quart cast iron Dutch oven. Funny thing about this one is uh, this particular one here. I kind of inherited it from my parents in that within the last 10 years or so, I got this as a present from my, for my parents. And then, well, my parents did uh, pass away, which of course happens to all of us. And so as a result, I ended up inheriting this pan back from them. Funny thing is, is that this, with this particular lodge pan here, twice now, I have actually tried to sell this pan at a flea market, largely because uh, I have, I mean, as much as I enjoy, no, as much as it is special in being from my parents, well, um, what can I say? It's like I actually have a fair amount of cast iron, and so I felt it probably wouldn't have been necessary to have this, and so not just once, but twice, I tried selling this one at a flea market. In both instances, nobody bought it. So I still have this pan, and I'm kind of wondering if that means I'm meant to have this pan, because as I said, I gave it to my parents, it came back to me, I tried twice to sell it at a flea market, still didn't sell, and it still came back to me. So maybe that is uh, telling me something. But right now, nonetheless, I'm going to keep putting, I'm going to put it to some use. And as you can see, I've chopped up these uh, potatoes, russet potatoes, of course. As you can see, I didn't even bother removing the skins because I like them with the skins on. Uh, I, I know some folks here who have been used to eating, you know, just uh, skinless mashed potatoes or maybe box mashed potatoes their entire life. And when they actually tried these kind of potatoes, they were apparently surprised at the texture. Um, I can only say I have been eating these smashed potatoes my entire life, and this is how I like them, and I enjoy it, and I'm going to keep uh, doing it. I'm going to keep making them this way. However, we are not done with this yet. Uh, now that we've done that, I've got to throw in a few other things, and oh, nuts. I always forget something. Here is an onion, which I forgot to peel before this video started. So I'm going to have to get this done as quickly as I can. Fortunately, I don't really have to mince this, uh, this onion. So let's see how quickly we can get this done. That means if I can do this right, there we go. I'll pull off that first layer of the onion. I know there are some folks who can do the entire thing like in, at once, but uh, I'm not that good, I'm afraid. 
I'm just doing it as best as I can to get this peeled. There we go. That wasn't so bad. Okay, now that we've done that, all I have to do is uh, give this onion a rough chop. I don't even have to uh, be, you know, I don't have to uh, really finely mince it because it's all going to be boiled and mashed anyway. So we will just break this up and put it into the pot. There we go. Nice and simple. This is a white onion for the record. And because I'm doing it quickly, I, this is also preventing me from getting tears in my eyes. Thank goodness. So there we go. Now that we've done that, we've got two other things. The other is cabbage. <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned, this is like a monster mash, which means it's something that you can certainly see. Gotta be careful here. There we go. Little by little. There we go. Uh, this is something, of course, that you can serve to your kids. Now, when now the thing, of course, with kids is they're kids. And they probably might not like the idea of having cabbage and spinach. You don't have to tell them that, of course. You know, as parents, we sometimes tend to do things like that. What I like, what I have done mainly for kids is I tell them what, what they're having are extreme mashed potatoes, you know, with a lot of sausage mixed in because, of course, you know, they like sausage. And what, what also we'll be having here is we're going to be having some green slime mixed in and to make it a monster mash. So you don't actually have to tell them that there's cabbage and spinach in this. You can just tell them it's green slime. And uh, so far, at least, I haven't had a problem with that. Probably more than enough, in fact. So I'll just uh, move this aside. And finally, now that we've done that, on top of this, we've got one last thing. And that is spinach to give it more of a uh, green color. Uh, I know called Cannon, Irish called Cannon, uh, actually is made with kale rather than spinach, but I like spinach. <laughs> so uh, kale is not bad, but I like spinach better. I grew up with spinach, so I, I don't have a problem with that. But anyway, yeah, there we go. There's a nice full pot. And to this, I will just have to get this into the sink to uh, full, uh, maybe about halfway full or so. And that's really about all we need. So let's get over here. Ugh. Do this as fast as we can. There we go. That's pretty good. And that won't take very long. Uh, there we go. That's probably enough. I've already salted it. You saw that at the beginning. Let's move over here. And I wanted to get this done now because this is going to be on the heat for about 50, 5 minutes. Uh, that includes about 20 minutes to get this thing up to boiling and another 30 minutes to boil it. And here's and one nice thing about doing this in cast iron. All of that fits without any difficulty. So on goes the heat. Come on. There we go. Oh, and we're done. Now all you have to do is sit and wait for about uh, the next 50 minutes. So not bad for a starter. Okay. Anyway, hello uh, once again to everybody. Because, yeah, no, I'm not quite done yet. I do have one other bit of preparation. We have got some sausages to cook up. So now is our chance, I guess, to, uh, get, um, yeah, to get on to the next step. Hello, Louis J. I hope I'm not interrupting your evening. I mean, I know you usually do yours on Wednesday, and I apologize. Uh, but uh, as I said, I had to delay my uh, live for uh, another night. But here we are nonetheless. However, I saw Louis J. You already commented on the TikTok video that Stargazer cooked, to uh, cooked that Stargazer produced today. Namely, that was the one about their uh, cast, uh, you know, about stargazers uh new process for making uh cast iron with what they call micro texture and it's for precisely that reason 
that I decided, actually, I can probably even move this over a little bit. It's for precisely that reason that I decided to bring out both the stargazer and the field skillet and uh, put them uh, through their paces, shall we? Because this here is a stargazer, a first generation stargazer. The manufacturing date of the stargazer here says it was made in 2000. 19. So this pan is already about four years old. Boy, time flies. Whereas here is the field number eight skillet that someone was kind enough to uh, provide to me just this year. So the field skillet definitely has what they call that micro texture in that it looks like a smooth surface, but when you run your fingers over it, you can definitely feel it like ultra fine sandpaper much finer than you might get from a Chinese skillet or a uh, large skillet. The uh, Stargazer, on the other hand, definitely is smooth. Oh, yeah, that's why I wanted to mention uh, Louis J. Let me turn on the heat on these things and start heating them up. Uh, yeah, because Louis J., you commented already uh, on the uh, Stargazer uh, video. You mentioned uh, the possibility that since you already have a Stargazer, could you send it back to them and they can refinish it for you with their new micro texture? And they replied already and they said yes. So um, so there, so I would say you contact them and you make the uh, necessary arrangements for that. Hello as well. Alma Wasilewski, my husband boils Esther in the electric coffee pot and puts it in the pot. Much faster, I'm old. <laughs> no dessert for Cynthia tonight. <laughs> Uh, where did my mouse go? I'm just making sure I'm not missing any uh, major comments here, folks, as well. Hello, Cynthia Wesley. No, you're not You're not late. I mean, after all, we are still here. Clico, I had bacon, fried cabbage, and onions with eggs for breakfast. Well, that sounds good. And fried cabbage and onions. Oh, I see. You're talking about cowboy cabbage then, I guess. You stick you strip your thumbs in the end with more in from the end with more layers. It's actually faster. Pat uh Pat Company coming for dinner soon. Well, that's good. I hope you enjoy I hope you enjoy yourself. Keep the pan. And by the way, happy Halloween. Um I'm not sure. Okay, William Hurt, I'm not sure which pan you're talking about. Hello, D Beaumont resident. Well, thank you very much. I'm wearing my very first cast iron Dutch oven from Lodge. Well, congratulations. And yes, I think you will enjoy it. You'll get a lot of use out of that Dutch oven. I especially like doing it to uh, make uh, my uh, Dutch oven chicken and rice. And I'm very much, um, very much encourage you to try that. They changed their surface finish around 2020. Really? It's been that long? <laughs> well, then again, again, I got my this pin in 2019. So, yeah, that was a year before they did that. But uh, nonetheless, that's how uh, modern day cast iron, the modern day cast iron uh, makers are doing. And I find it interesting because it means really <laughs> because they are once again following in the footsteps of Lodge cast iron. And I'm not trying to sound to say this to sound like a fanboy of Lodge, or especially Lodge is not paying me to say that. But it's I mean, it's interesting how all of the uh all of the new small companies and sellers all trying to sell their own brands of cast iron, they all do it the same way. They start bashing Lodge cast iron, you know, for their rough surface, or they're so heavy, or they're so old fashioned. And yet it seems like they're doing the same thing now that Lodge was doing at least 10 years ago. But that's all right, because, I mean, I, as I said, I've had the Stargazer for the past four years, and I certainly don't have any complaints about that. Uh, I have enjoyed using it, and that's one reason why I'm bringing it out tonight. So that, well, again, among other things, I can touch up on the uh, seasoning. That would certainly help as well. Because, of course, the best way to keep your pan seasoned is to use them constantly. That's why, even though it's been mentioned that, yes, you can send your uh, uh, Stargazer skillet back to them for refinishing, I'm not going to do so. Uh, I've managed to get some seasoning on mine, and I'm just going to keep on using it. And I just realized I forgot something. I forgot my tongs. Because, uh, where is it? Uh, where are my tongs? Here they are. Okay, good. 
because what we are going to be doing now is throwing in some sausages. Uh, yeah, because sausages are, of course, one of the uh, things about cull cannon. You don't have to include it if you want. If you don't want to, you can make it completely veggie. However, of course, uh, the traditional way of making cull cannon is to throw a lot of meat into it. And so that, of course, is what we should do. And the best way to do is to start it right now. There we go. Four, five, six. And on the other hand, let's do this here too. It's going to be a lot of sausages, but I'm just going to keep some out to the side so that uh, when I serve this, we can just have some regular sausages along the side with the uh, cull cannon. But there we go. And, and as I said, the best way to keep uh, this pan seasoned anyway. So uh, why am I seeing? Oh, yeah, I see a couple of things here. Um, let's make sure. Okay. Nothing better than good sight. Can't go without my glasses. Well, definitely, yeah. Missed the intro. What's on the menu today? Uh, I am making Monster Mash. Uh, over here uh, in this uh, cauldron or this large cast iron Dutch oven, I've got a lot of potatoes, some cabbage, onions, and spinach all boiling up. Uh, that will and but it, it only just started, so we have quite a ways to go. And over here, I'm going to be making some sausages. Some of these sausages I'm actually going to uh, chop up and mix in with the um, with the um, mashed potatoes because this is going to be an that's why we're going to call it monster mash or as as Rick Stumbaugh says call cannon. On the other hand, there is more than enough sausages here. Some of them I'm just going to keep out on the side. Okay. Uh, which pan did you gift? Um, okay. Um, the pan, okay, yeah, now, yes, I did go, as I said, to the book signing, and I met Matt, uh, Max Miller, and just to uh, be generous, really, just because I thought it would be a nice gift to give him, I did indeed give him a cast iron skillet, and the one I gave him is uh, one that uh, folks here in this community know as a uh, generic gate mark um, skillet. Meaning it was the kind with a teardrop shape. Uh, teardrop shape handle comes from an unknown manufacturer or more likely one of several manufacturers. Uh, the kind that uh, would come with an accessory set for a wood burning stove. This one did have two pour spouts. Uh, the nice thing about this one is it's actually a size number nine, which is unusual for that kind of pan. But folks who know their cast iron, and some of you folks probably have one of those, uh, we're talking about those pans that, again, are, uh, they were, in fact, cheaply made um, during the, when, okay, the history of those pans was that, just that, when, uh, when they introduced wood-burning stoves in the later part of the uh, 19th century, those things really took the country by storm. You know, they were phenomenally successful to the point where they became a fixture in just about every uh, American home. I mean, after all, nobody cooks their daily meals over the fireplace anymore. You have to have a stove to go with it. So, uh, yes, it started out with wood-burning stoves. But, of course, up until the time when wood-burning stoves were introduced, they were um, naturally... Folks only had the, the type of cookware that would work in a fireplace. Namely, they would have uh, cookware with legs for standing up in the fire. You know, we're talking like spider skillets and long-legged Dutch ovens. Or maybe uh, hanging griddle, things to hang over the fire. Or even pots to hang over the fire. So for a lot of folks, if you were going to get a wood-burning stove... You would have to, uh, you know, something, you would need something to fit onto the flat top surface of that wood burning stove. And that's one reason why the manufacturers, pretty much as a rule of thumb, 
they started making the, those uh, generic cast iron sets to go with their stove. And in a lot of instances, when you bought a wood burning stove, they uh, would include a free complimentary or maybe dirt cheap, you know, at a low price uh, set of cookware to go with it. Uh, you know, it, uh, they did a lot. They did that a lot in those days. Uh, you know, those kind of things were considered disposable items. <laughs> I know I've been criticized for calling them disposable. How dare you call cast iron pans disposable? <laughs> You've seen the comments on my YouTube video. Some people have really taken me to task on that. But what I'm referring to is they were cheaply made. You know, they didn't put a lot of effort or cost into them. Um, the retailers just kept piles of them to make into their sets so that they could give them away with the, with the uh, stoves. Or as I said, maybe for maybe a slightly additional cost, you get a set of complimentary cookware to go with it. You know, nothing too fancy. And a typical stove would include well, pretty much one or two of everything. You, there would almost certainly be a cast iron skillet to go with it, along with maybe a griddle, uh, one of those bulge kettles, you know, to uh, as well for uh, making stews and boiling water. And uh, you might get one or two other things to go with it as well. It really depends on what was available. But those were the type of things that they would uh, give away. And of course, they were, there were quite a few of them. And um, even though they were considered to be, you know, as I said, disposable items, you know, they didn't really care about them. All they really cared about was selling the stove. Nonetheless, because they were made of cast iron, many of them have survived even when the, even last longer than the stove. So we, even though a lot of those wood burning stoves are no longer available, those cast iron pans can still be found quite frequently at antique malls, sometimes at flea markets, and the like. It's a piece of American history that they don't talk much about. So that's the type of pan I decided to uh, give to Max Miller uh, because yeah, you've seen his channel where he cooks some amazing dishes from history. Sometimes he does it in a cast iron pan. And yes, he uses a modern day lodge cast iron pan. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But of course, I just got the idea that, you know, to go along with those amazing uh, recipes from history, I thought it would be appropriate for him to use a vintage cast iron pan for making those recipes. And that's why I went out on the hunt and uh, found one of those uh, cast, one of those uh, generic gate mark skillets, and I'm more than happy to have given it to to give it to um, Max uh, as of last night. I can only hope he gets some use out of it. I mean, yeah, if he actually uses it in his videos, I'll be stoked. I'll be really, really happy. I'm not asking him to give me credit. I would just love to see it. On the other hand, I would at least like to know that he's using the pan, even if he doesn't use it in video, in his videos, even if he just does it in private with his husband, that would be enough. Because those pans, oh no, yes, it's happening again. Hold on, folks. Ah. Shut up. Ugh. Sorry about that, folks. Yes, it happened again. Yes, I forgot. <laughs> I was so excited for uh, doing this tonight that, yeah, I forgot what is a necessary step in my kitchen. Ugh. Chaos detector, as you call it. Yes, exactly. Chaos ensues. What else is new? There, but then again, there you go. If one of your steps in making in cook, one of your regular steps is to take care of the smoke detector when it goes off, you might have cast iron Ida. But that was my story of uh, getting that uh, cast iron pan and presenting it to a max.
Uh, the nice thing about that one is it's actually a size nine pant. And I was quite surprised when I found it too. You know, number nine is an unusual size for those kind of pants. Um, yes, it's true that the brand names like Griswold, you know, they had number nine size fairly often, but you don't see that very often in those um, in those uh, gate mark skillets. You usually see them in a number eight or number seven size. Number seven is pretty common as well, sometimes even in a six. But I would say seven and eight are the most common size. So at least he's, at least he'll be lucky enough to be using an unusual one of those pans if he uses it. All I can do is keep an eye on his channel. And I guess his blog and his Twitter and, and see what he thinks of it. And I certainly hope he likes it. Okay. Anyway. Oh, yeah. One other thing. The cookbook is wonderful, too. I mean, basically, of course, you know, pretty much he took his videos and transcribed them with some nice pictures. So if you've seen the videos on his channel, then you know what's in the cookbook. And yes, I definitely want to make some of those videos. Now that I have the cookbook, I'm pretty much committed to make some of those videos, some of those recipes. I considered doing one of them tonight, but with just about all of them, there's two things. You either have to uh, dig up some very special ingredients or they take longer to cook than you would than uh, a typical video like I do here. You know, my videos seem to last between an hour and an hour and a half. And not many of those recipes are done in that amount of time. Because, of course, you have to do everything from scratch, not that I mind. And you have to cook them to, uh, sometimes for like, I mean, depending on what you're making, you could be cooking it for two, four, six hours or so. You know, rising your dough or slow cooking your uh, beef. So yeah, but I'm I'll, I'm going to work on that and see what I can come up with. Also, I have already made Christmas plum pudding. That's one of the um, that's one of the uh, videos. Uh, that's one of the recipes in there. Um, I could make hardtack. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay, nonetheless, and he has to make some of the ingredients. Yes, exactly. So. I ordered my first cast iron Dutch oven from Lodge. Should receive it tomorrow. Looking forward to making those baked beans. And again, congratulations on that. I certainly hope you like it. You will fall in love. I certainly, yeah, I certainly do hope you like them. Yes. And likewise, yeah, we need a new red bowl. <laughs> Shit. I usually run my fan aimed at the smoke detector with a window open. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's the thing. Of course, we're getting into that time of year where it's getting cold out, so, it, so we can only leave the open for, for a certain period of time. It's better than winning the million-dollar lottery. Oh, really? Yeah, they microtextured the surface of original skillets. Surprised they still offer it. That's a lot of sausages. Yeah, I hope you have some wine showing. Well, I do have wine, actually, as a matter of fact. And yeah, I know it's a lot of sausages, but... I'm going to be serving this to my neighbor. I've got a friend who's uh, actually going to be coming over to uh, try Cull Cannon for the first time. Hope she likes it. But I'm, I'm going to be giving some extra sausages as well, just in case she doesn't like the Cull Cannon, so that that way she'll still have something to eat. Speaking of which, got to do something essential here, and that is, Start checking the temperature of these things because, yeah, that's the thing about sausages. You know, you can't undercook them. Also, it looks like we're not going to have any problem at all with that. These things here are already, it looks like, jumping up to like about 140 to 150 degrees. So, in fact, you're not doing too badly. Uh, I just got to make sure I've got all the sides cooked, uh, every side of these. That's why I'm constantly turning them in the pan to be sure that one side doesn't burn while another side is, is not browned. But there we go. 
Well, all I have to do is just keep it in the pan long enough, and uh, they will be done. That's another thing, a nice thing about sausages. They're very easy to make. Anyway, it was because, as I said, because of the announcements of Stargazer that I got out both the Stargazer and the Field Skillet, both of which are doing a fine job cooking these sausages. Uh, you know, every so often, I have done one of those uh, cast iron side-by-side -side challenges. You know, like, for instance, modern versus vintage, BSNR versus Stargazer. Or, for that matter, Stargazer versus Fields. And in just about every instance, it's always been the same thing. It's a tie. I really can't say one cooked it better than the other. Because that's usually the case. I mean, pretty much any cast iron pan will do a wonderful job cooking in the kitchen. Including cheap Asian-made skillets. Which, of course, gets into the argument, well, then why should you bother spending all that money on a field or a uh, stargazer skillet when a lodge or a Walmart Ozark trail will work just fine? And that's a tough argument. And the best answer I can give for that is you would really do this, get a field or a stargazer for pretty much the same reason, you might do a... I'm going to actually turn on the uh, fan here, which I probably should have done before. Uh, vent fan. There we go. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yeah. You get a uh, field or a stargazer skillet. For the same reason, you might get a Shun or Global or Henkel chef knife. When you could just as easily get a Cuisinart or even a Dexter. You know, because they work fine too. Um, typically, these are the types of things, you know, maybe it's the heat, but it seems like the, the Stargazer seems to be browning or blackening these sausages maybe better than the field. However, I think it's probably because of the heat. In fact, I should probably turn the heat down a little bit on this. Turn it up a little bit more in the uh, field in the back. But yes. Um, you know, because I guess it's like spending the extra money or getting the extra quality. Kind of like makes it something special. As a Christmas present or a wedding present or a birthday present. You know, you're getting something truly special. Of course, whenever I go to a wedding, I make a point of getting a lodge skillet and giving that as a present because that is really a necessity I've found to give it a wedding. Strangely enough, I always seem to be the only one doing that. It seems odd. In fact, I think I'll even change the keys around a little bit. Put a couple of these in here, a couple of these over here. There we go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. Anyway. Uh, Finex are beautiful. Yes, they are. I saw Cowboy Kent Rollins talking about Finex. They did look like a fabulous pen. I'm not a lodge girl. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Well, I know there are still folks, of course, who swear only by vintage cast iron. And that, of course, is your choice. Especially if you have a set of cookware that you inherited, lucky enough, from your parents or grandparents. Probably your grandparents. Because usually your parents probably came from the era when cast iron was, was not so popular. You know, when non-stick skillets were the thing. Like in the 60s and 70s and the 80s. So at that time, your parents were probably using your grandparents' cast iron, whereas they were using their Teflon pans and who knows what else. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm certainly not dissing your parents. I mean, after all, you folks are here. So it's not like you died from them or anything. Nonetheless, there's still something special about cast iron. Debbie, close to my meal today. Rick had been in Dallas all day in that horrible traffic. Well, sorry about that. Rick, PB&J is my fave. You can stop. That's my favorite, but I don't have blue cheese around here. You definitely say that each pan has its own personality. There is that as well. I mean, I like the way the stargazer is so smooth, and these things really just slide around on the surface. This Finex on the other and Finex. This field on the other hand is doing a great job. And I'm certainly not having complaints about this either. So yes, I can only thank um, Louie for uh, sending this field as a gift. But it's not necessary to send any more gifts, folks. I think I said that part as well. Even though we're getting into that time of year, I am again once again saying. No, don't send me any more gifts. I don't need them. I have enough stuff in my kitchen. But these are uh, turning out quite nice. Really just a matter of, you know, keep turning them until they are uh, completely done. Nice. What's going to be a Christmas present? I wanted a Finex so much. It was two years. Finally, buy one for myself. Oh, yes, Quico. So you did get a Finex then. And I would presume you still have it. Because that Finex is a wonderful skillet, isn't it? In fact, Louis J., I saw he has a whole collection of Finex. Gee, quite an impressive collection for that matter. Yeah, I'm still using my Finex pretty much any time I want to get out of state, for instance. I definitely break out the Finex for that. As I said, I wanted to break out the uh, Stargazer and the Field, especially because of uh, Stargazer's announcement today. Bangers. Hmm. Bangers, and we're going to have mash to go with it, too, Andrew. I know you like to pick. But I eat your heart out. I like peanut butter and vanilla wafers. I purchased my first log skillet 12 years ago. After years of dealing with that texture, I saw videos of standing the outside. Oh, okay. Well, everybody has their own uh, preference. So um, I've been using my log skillet as well, and I, for one, have not had a problem with it. But as I said, to each their own, I, the best I could say is do what works for you. So I'm not going to come down really with just about anyone, regardless of whether or not they season their cast iron with black seed oil <clears throat> or whether they grind down their pans or throw them in the fire. I would prefer they not throw them in the fire. But then again, it's their cast iron, and they can do what they want with it. And anyway, if you are getting a lot of use out of your sanded down lodge, then again, congratulations, and the more power to you. My lodge has got smooth on their own. Yes, exactly. The handles get smooth. I've had great results with the great seed oil now. Too much is never enough with this crowd. Exactly. That was what J.R. Bob Dobbs said. Too much is always better than not enough. Meanwhile, this, pen, this pot here is uh, steaming nicely. So, yeah, we are going to have ourselves some uh, monster mash in a little bit. Anyway, this is not going to be too difficult. As you can see, this is pretty easy. I mean, all I did was throw the uh, veggies and everything into the pot. And I've just been busy uh, frying up these sausages. Nothing to it. Nice and simple. This really is the type of thing you could make for the kids after coming home from work. I tried called Cannon for the first time 22 years ago. I had an Irish girl, uh, girlfriend at the time and was cooked. Old world cooking at its finest. Yes, indeed. In fact, 
it is really the way it's really pretty much close to a generic British Isles type of food. You know what they say about uh, the, about the British Isles? They boil the heck out of everything. And that's exactly what they do with cold cannon. All they do is throw it all in the pot, into the pot and boil the heck out of it. In fact, a lot of times they just simply throw the pork and the meat into the pot and boil that too. But as you can see, I like doing, I like uh, frying these up. Because it, again, it gives you that wonderful Maillard effect. There's the science. You know, adds extra flavor with the uh, blackening on the top here, on the uh, outside. I had a very old number 14 Lodge goat that was so smooth. But I ended up giving it to my niece. She loves it. Well, nothing wrong with that. She's definitely getting a lot of use out of it. And it's something she's never going to forget. Besides, if you need a number 14, you can always get another one. <laughs> if you don't have a 14, I do recommend it. I've said that piece before as well. Namely that everyone should have at least one big cast iron pan in their kitchen. I've said many times you will get a lot of use, more use than you might expect out of at least one big cast iron pan. I mean, here I am using two skillets to fry up all these sausages. If you had one big cast iron pan, you could do all this in one pan. There's one example for you. These are probably done at this point. I think we're going to turn off the heat in fact. Just think, she might give it to her niece one day. Exactly. My biggest is the number 11, Erie. Well, then, well, congratulations. You've got real treasure there, but I'm sure you know that already. You know, Erie and number 11, both of these, both of those are rare. So you know that if you were to sell it, you would get a pretty penny for it. Except that in this crowd, we would recommend you not sell it. Because even if you get a few hundred dollars for that pan, you know, that's not going to change your life. And then you will no longer have your Erie number 11. For that reason, I would rather recommend using those wonderful vintage pieces. And that's what I said in my letter to Max Miller as well. I left a PS saying, I would recommend that you use these pans regularly, whether in your on your show or in private. You know, because using them, will uh, certainly keep them in much better condition than simply storing them away. And that indeed is uh, my recommendation for pretty much anybody. The best way to keep your cast iron season is to use it. And that's why I do my best to try to work my way through my collection, even though it's not easy. <laughs> My biggest, says Debbie, is my Birmingham Stoven Range one, and it's not real heavy either. Well, I'm surprised. Usually people say Birmingham Stoven Range pans are pretty heavy, and that includes me and my BSR collection. True, but I watched a person drop a cast iron pan, and the handle broke off. Ouch. Yeah, my condolences on that. Yes, I like sausages. Well, as I said... A lot of these are going to go to my neighbor when I give her cold cannon because just in case she doesn't like cold cannon, that way at least I'll be able to serve her some sausages. So it's kind of like a win-win situation. Probably about half of these I'm going to put into the pot and mash it away with the cold cannon. The other half will be available as is. My cast iron rusted during the nine months I was in the nursing home. Ouch. My condolences, LT. Andrew Bonificio used my tenant's lodge every day. And that's how it's done. And I'd say that's how these are done, too. So, um, it's ten minutes of nine. I got this uh, into the pot. At about quarter past eight, so it's only been about 35 minutes. Got at least another 15 minutes yet before these before I'm done with this. So we still have plenty of time. Not in any rush. Things are doing pretty good here. 
Oh, uh, yeah, actually, one thing I think I want to ask folks about when I actually make this, you know, when when you mashed potatoes come out of the pot, what we have to do, of course, is mix in a lot of butter and a lot of milk. Well, I'm wondering, I have got a lot of cream cheese to use. And what would your opinion, folks, be of using cream cheese instead of butter? You know, I can put, I can throw in an eight ounce block of cream cheese and melt that in. And then, of course, mix in the milk as well. You can fix the rust. Yes, you can. Alma, the guy had just showed off a nice seasoning, too. I attacked it all with the steel wool, and it's good again. Well, that's good. Then definitely keep using it. All right. You can probably turn the fan off now. There we go. Besides, if I understand right, that will probably improve the uh, reception of my microphone as well. I noticed that. When there's a lot of sound it tends to kind of like dull the reception of the microphone but now things should uh, sound a lot better at least i hope so cream cheese may just work only problem is when it cools it can congeal well there is that okay you do have a good point there so maybe i should just stick with butter especially since it's for my neighbors and i don't yeah so i probably shouldn't experiment i should just uh, do something that i know will work so i will stick with butter Maybe try the cream cheese myself next time with another pot of potatoes. Cream cheese is great in potatoes, says Clico. Okay, well, there's one and the other. One says yes, one says no. Took me a good two hours to clean the lodge I got this past this weekend at the flea market with, with a lid. Grease was nasty, but it's clean now and working good. Ooh, well, I hope you didn't pay too much for that, Pam. Never had it congeal, but to be safe, I guess stick with the butter. Okay, so I guess that's kind of two votes for the butter. All right, I will uh, definitely keep that in mind. Nonetheless, things are uh, looking pretty good here. So far, so good. Anyway, there we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nice. All right. There we go. This might make a nice photo. Two skillets full of sausages. Turn this around. Yeah, that actually looks pretty good. Change that to a photo. There we go. <laughs> are those bangers done yet? I would definitely say they are at this point. Still waiting on that answer. <laughs> it was scrubbing. It wasn't bad. The grease that was in it, it was uh, stuck and stinking. Ouch. I really hope you didn't pay a lot for that lodge pan, that's for sure. Just use a half block of cream cheese. Well, I might do that. All right. Okay. So anyway, I mentioned, uh, as I said, um, my trip to uh, see Max Miller, which turned out good. We've got our um, monster mash on the way. I guess one thing to consider, other than that, is that Halloween is on the way. Oh, man. Would you believe less than two weeks to go? In fact, it's a week from, uh, yeah, it's a week from Tuesday, no less. <laughs> so the sad part is, you know what happens these days? Probably two days before Halloween, the stores like Walmart are going to take down their Halloween stuff. So that by the time Halloween night is is done, it comes here. You know what the stores are going to be full of? Yep. Christmas. The season is approaching, like it or not. Oh, well. We can live with it. And anyway, at least for those of us 
Uh, we know there is something, of course, we can uh, get ready to give his presents in the holidays. And that would be cast iron. Unless, of course, you have uh, family and friends who, like me, you've already plied with more than enough cast iron to last them the rest of their lives. <laughs> so they are probably telling you outright, as I know they're telling me, don't give us any more cast iron. <laughs> so that's something I'm going to have to consider as well. <laughs> you have to freeze cream cheese for two months. Mm. $10 at the marketplace. Well, that's not a bad price for a lodge pad. Got to make sausage gravy from this. Hmm. Yeah, there's a plan. Might actually consider that. All right. But considering that the um, cull cannon is going to be done in just about 10 minutes, I'm not sure I have time to put a gravy together. No, I can hear that's hissing, in fact. That's about what I spent on that skillet this weekend. I paid 12 with the lid. With the lid, a 10-inch skillet. That's not bad. 12 for a lodge pan with a lid. So there you go. And the best part, of course, is, is that it's going to last you for the rest of your life. So congratulations on that. All right, on my way to Alma's house. I don't blame you. Anyway, um... Okay, modern day pans. Um, as I mentioned before, we got the uh, field and the uh, the field and the uh, stargazer here, both of which have a, a nice surface. Um, I could point out yet another pan, another modern day pan. This is the butter pat pan, which also, by the way, does not have the glass smooth surface that you might expect. So, um, yeah, all of the modern cast iron makers, it seems like they're all going the same route or route that uh, Lodge did. Namely, that they want something that will hold on to the seasoning and encourage folks to uh, use them, especially if they're, get, if they're new to cast iron. So that's not bad. It's also, it's all, uh, also say Northland Aluminum Products. That's before they called them Nordic Ware. Well, that's nice. Then you definitely have yourself quite a uh, co vintage collection there. And again, the best I could say is to uh, get used to it. I'm sorry, not get used to it. Get a lot of use out of it. Writes Trump. I was, I, want, I was wanting to get an induction countertop cooking where I can afford it, but I was scared it might damage the antique cast iron. Just wondering if anyone has any issues with induction. Induction works great with cast iron. I had an, an induction plate myself until it burned out, unfortunately. It seemed to last about two years when then it just sim simply stopped working. Um, I have heard reports that, yes, it is possible an induction plate can actually hurt vintage cast iron. For the same reason that an electrical stove could warp your cast iron, namely that it could heat it up far too fast to the point where you could actually end up getting warping or a crack. So what you would have to do in that case is to start with a very low heat and then work your way up. So there's one, so that would probably be my uh, best suggestion there. My luck is back to normal. Well, yeah, I, again, I know that feeling too. That was kind of what happened with me on my road trip yesterday. Uh, the road, the actual event, as I mentioned, was uh, was good. But on the way there, I made not one but two detours in the hope of finding something interesting, and both of them turned out to be nothing. On the first detour, I went in search of an antique store that I thought was in the area, but I could not find it. The second detour, I went in search of UFOs. It seems that in uh, eastern New York, there is a town called Pine Bush. And apparently the deal is the, the town is supposed to be obsessed with UFOs. And they've got a UFO museum in their downtown area. And several of their local stores have UFO decorations. And it's supposed to be a great place for that. Well, I went there yesterday. And the UFO museum was closed uh, in that 
there was um, in that it was only open to sell tickets for their Halloween events. Nothing at all for UFOs. There was an antique store there that was also uh, not open yesterday. So, unfortunately, it was not a uh, not a successful trip in that respect. At least it made up for it when the um, yeah, as I said, when I actually got to the bookstore and the uh, and the line formed and people were all excited to uh, see you know, to see Max. That at least made it worthwhile. So I can't regret about that. Back then they called them fluted uh, tube pans. Oh yes. Ah, you're talking about the cast iron bunt pans, or maybe not even the cast iron ones. Well, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's well known that um, Nordic wear uh, copyrighted or trademarked the name bunt. And before then, while they did have pans in that design, it's true they called them fluted pans. Or of course, when they came from Europe, they were the Google hoof pans. I was lucky enough to acquire one, and I'm certainly glad to have done so. Am I obsessed, or do they actually get visits? <laughs> I use your trick of heating large skillets in the oven before putting on the stove. Oh, yeah, that is something I've done as well, yes. But, yes, you heat that up to 500 degrees in the oven before putting it on the stove, and that does a great job, especially if you're using a cast iron wok. Uh, that way you'll have even heating on the wok all the way from the bottom to the top. And that is indeed something I would recommend. All right. Anyway, now that I've done this, one thing I do have to do, uh, one thing I have to do is put the rest of these sausages back in the, oops, sorry. Oh, what in the world? Um, just one moment. Hello, this is Eric speaking. Hello? Uh, Hello? Yes, hi. Um, hi, I'm in the middle of a live video. Sorry. All right. Okay. But I'll talk to you in a few minutes. If you want to come over, feel free. Oh, I think that was my neighbor. Anyway, where was I? Oh, yes, that's right. I need to put um, these uh, the rest of these sausages back in the fridge. And then... For some of these sausages, probably about half of them, let's get them onto a plate. There we go. Let's get some of these sausages onto a plate and start cutting them up so that we can mix them in with the call cannon, which is going to be done in just a couple of minutes, I'm pleased to say. Oh, by the way, look at this. I'm already holding this uh, stargazer skillet without uh, without gloves or a pot holder. So there's something for you. But anyway, let's get these out of the pan. Yeah, that's one advantage of the long handle of that stargazer, as you can see. Uh, it really did not take it long for it to cool off. And I might as well use the same knife. Save good time that way. In fact, let's see if we can get a little closer here. And just do some quick slicing here. Little and there. That's another nice thing about having a sharp knife in that it's easy to cut things like these sausages. As you can see, I'm using tongs to hold on to it. Careful. Don't want to uh, be too, don't want to try to show off here. There we go. And here's another couple. I think I should do these two at a time. In fact, come on, there we go. And there, and here, now we're getting somewhere. And there we go. This and that and the other thing. Oops, and I just dropped a piece. My bad. Ugh. Sorry about that. All right. I'm going to have to get that piece off. Throw that out because I don't want to take any chances. Not with sausage. Anyway, the neighbor knows you are cooking. Oh, yeah, by that smoke alarm. Well, there is that. <laughs> Give it to the cat. Well... 
Mobley actually doesn't eat cooked food. I've tried many times, and she just does, and she just turns her nose up at it. About the only thing she has not turned her nose up at sometimes is cooked bacon. And granted, this is sausage, but it's not quite the same. Okay. Sometimes admiring is, okay, every time the chaos detector goes off, good food follows. Well, I certainly hope so. But nonetheless, we are now at that point because it has been 50 minutes. And so we are certainly ready at this point, especially with the way you can see this thing steaming along, to get out our Monster Mash. Well, it's called Cannon right now. It will be Monster Mash in a little bit. So. Means I gotta move this aside and this and the other thing. And now it's time to drain this. I better turn this off. And this thing is definitely very hot. So gotta get out my gloves now. Go over to the sink so that you can be witnesses if I kill myself with a steam burn. I'm kidding sort of, but let's get this out and carefully, oh man, this is heavy, away we go. Okay, ah. there, move this over here. Phew. And there we are. And now for the big reveal. Ta-da. Yeah, that's why I say green slime, and that's what the kids will think as well. Okay, got to get this front and center. There we go. But nonetheless, here, ready for mashing is our call cannon, which means now we get to uh, just prepare the next step. And that would be get out some butter and milk. Here we go. I have three sticks of butter left. I have to get some more butter after this. Uh, and milk. And start throwing in the extra ingredients. All right, I can see, oops, a couple of comments here. All right, my cats are high right now. I gave them kitty weed. Oop, you bad girl. I'd be using a pound of butter. <laughs> Kale wouldn't wilt up as much. Well, I like, yeah, as I said, I like spinach and I like the way the spinach wilts up as well. It'll, it'll blend together nicely, so. All right. Mine is the cheap version, but love. Okay, so we throw in our butter. And then from here, we start throwing in, let me see. Since I already salted this before um, adding the, um, you know, before uh, adding the water, I don't need any more salt. But what we do need is some pepper. I make sure to get rough ground pepper and not the um, not the powdered stuff. Some garlic powder. There we go. A little bit of dried basil, not too much. I find that the basil tends to overwhelm it. Parsley, and it seems like, oh, come on, hold on, damn it. Hello, this is Eric speaking. Hey, this is Chris. Hello, what's up? I'm still at work. What? Still at work? Uh, still working? Uh, yeah, but it's come. It's just come out of the uh, oven right now, and I'm just getting ready to mash it all up. As I said, if, if you want to uh, come over, feel free to do so. Yeah, I was going to come to a side corner of there. I just need to go right. I'm sorry for a ritual. Okay. 
Well, whatever you'd like, feel free to come over. I've got sausages, oh, too. Thank you. Okay. You. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anyway, where was I? I had just done. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, I was about to end. I was about to add the parsley. And some folks say you can never have too much parsley, although I might disagree with that. And then finally, here's one thing my neighbor has been saying. She's been saying that I don't add enough seasoning to my, to my food. She thinks my food is kind of bland. I like the taste of it myself. I think I, I enjoy tasting the food itself. However, largely for her, I'm going to mix in some Old Bay with this. So there we go. So there will definitely be seasoning in this. All right. Now that we've done that, all we have to do now, besides that butter, is throw in a bunch of milk. And with that, we are now ready to start mashing. Get out my masher here. And I'm thinking this might be an excuse to tell my masher story again. Oh, yes. Or as Santa might say, now mash away, mash away, mash away all. Which means I work my way down. But yes, I am quite proud of my masher. This thing here is more than a foot long, in fact. You might even say I'm compensating for something with it. That's largely because I got my masher off of Amazon. Um, I went looking for an industrial strength masher, the kind that they use in, in restaurants. Largely because I started out using dollar store mashers. And those stupid things kept breaking after only one or two uses. And I got tired of it. And so finally, I decided just that. I was going to get myself the type of masher that would last the rest of my life. But because I'm a cheapskate, I wanted to get one that was not especially expensive. So I went on to Amazon and found a masher from Winco, you know, the company that provides a lot of restaurant equipment. And the masher said four inches. And I thought that meant it was four inches in length. Turns out four inches was the width. The length of this thing, on the other hand, as I said, is more than a foot. So yeah, when I actually got this thing, I did not ex I did not expect it to be so big. However, it works. I have been using this masher for the past several years. I think it might be almost 10 years at this point. And this thing certainly does a good job. It mashes. So I certainly have no complaints with using this. And as a result, this is my heavy duty masher. All right. And with that, there's only one thing I have not yet added to this, and that is the sausage. So there we go. In it goes. And you know, you don't even have to do this at this point. But I'm still mashing it up, trying to spread it out. If folks want to make this and just simply add the uh, sausage pieces to it as is, you could certainly do so. But nonetheless, here it is. And that sure didn't take long either, did it? Nonetheless, as I said, with lots of green slime and a nice green tint to it, here is our Monster Mash, a.k.a. Call Cannon. Or, as you want to tell your kids, extreme mashed potatoes with sausages and green slime. <laughs> oh. 
But yeah, this really wasn't so hard. I mean, other than the 50 minutes it took to boil all this, this really was not difficult. And we've got a huge pot of this stuff too. So there's certainly more than enough to give to my neighbor. All right. And now having said that, what I probably should do is get out a spoon and taste test it. So where did it go? Um, let's see. Here it is. My favorite spoon, namely my titanium spork. Let's go in and take a peek, try it out. Hot. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm hmm. Not bad. Hmm. You know. Hmm. I think she might like it. Um. Hmm. You know, I might have to put in more butter, in fact. I think we might need a little bit more butter flavoring. So, not sure what I have for that. I may have to throw in a little bit more butter as quickly as I can. But nonetheless, Again, the whole point of this tonight, of course, was to do some Halloween cauldron cooking because, I mean, that's what we have here. I mean, this is indeed a cast iron cauldron. Here's the other thing. Um, you know, folks, especially around this time of year, love the idea of cooking in a genuine witch's cauldron. And in fact, that's exactly what this is because I'm not making this up either. This is, in fact, a modern-day cauldron. And I'm not just saying that. Because, quite frankly, that's all a uh, Dutch oven or an old-fashioned Dutch oven or cauldron is. Really the same thing. Because a cauldron is just a big cooking pot. That, If you look it up in the dictionary, that's exactly what the definition is of a cauldron. It's a big cooking pot. So, yes... A Dutch oven is, in fact, a cauldron. It, it works just fine as a cauldron, as you can see. You can make whatever potions you want with it, such as uh, what we have here. Some Halloween monster mash. Hmm. About the only thing this doesn't... Oh, hold on. Come on. This is getting annoying. Hello, this is Eric speaking. Hello? Hello? Did you butt dial me by mistake? Because I'm not hearing anything. I'm betting that's exactly what happened. Okay. Nonetheless. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's see what we have here. All right, we've got Oopsie's cat. My Henry bought me squirrels, eight squirrels. Oh, nice. Hmm. All right, uh, you've been here now. How long? Still getting shocked. <laughs> we had to catch the squirrel since the dog was high. Oh, that sounds interesting. A little bit shocked at the additional dried basil. Oh, basil, I find it goes great with the, with mashed potatoes. Not too much. I mean, I would definitely prefer more parsley in my mashed potatoes, but basil actually uh, makes a nice, uh, gives it a nice touch. At least that's my opinion. Andrew, that's okay, unless the mice are getting high too and hunting the cats. <laughs> She's still playing phone tech with the... I'll well, see your black cats in your videos. Nice. They look like good mousers. It's, it's now the monster mash, says Elsie's cat. Definitely. We definitely have our monster mash here. And there it is. And I'd say we are ready. Kale wouldn't wilt up as much. Well, indeed, that's one reason why I use spinach. All right. 
In addition to mashed potatoes, uh, something about earth. I don't, I can't read that. Um, oh, yeah. It, best addition to mashed potatoes on earth, preserved lemons. Ooh, that sounds good. Unfortunately, I don't have any lemons. I mean, I could throw in some lemon juice if I wanted to, I suppose. I have a funny story about that. I have my bowl ready. Well, yeah, there we are. As I said, here is our cauldron full of monster mash. One more spoonful, and then I will have to get it ready for them. Mm. Mm. Now that's better. All right. So I think what I should do now is get a container for them. So let me quickly uh, dig out a container here. And this is one reason why I buy these containers at dollar stores. So that that way I won't have to worry about asking for it back. All right, do this as quickly as we can. But nonetheless, as I said, this again is what I hope to be something that Folks may want to consider at Halloween or indeed any other time of the year. Because again, I find this to be, well, as I said, I enjoy making this. It's easy to make, it's tasty. I like to think, even though it looks like slop at this point, I like to think something that even kids would, would enjoy. And best of all, consider as well, if you make this on Halloween, feed it to your kids before they go out trick-or-treating. That means they will be full. And they will be a lot less likely to uh, snack on the candy before they bring it home. So there is something to consider as well. There we go. Here is our coal cannon. And to that, we have a little bonus as well. Namely, the rest of the sausages. We just plop two, three, four, five, six. There we are. Ah. All right, mom is all right, dad is all right. They just seem a little weird. Well, you could say that about all of our parents. They just seem a little weird, so I'll take it at that. Comfort food, person after my own heart, store containers. Yes, exactly, as I said. This way I can just give these things away and forget about them so I don't have to worry about asking for them back. Bangers and mash, that's exactly what it is. We've got our bangers and we've got our mash, our monster mash. So that means now ready to be given away. Okay, there we are. I can only hope they like it. And that is our cauldron cooking. So as I said, we've you you know we've made our uh, monster mash in a cast iron cauldron tonight which is something I would like uh, folks to consider on Halloween because it's easy to make, as I said, and it's something I think even kids would like. And then from there, we can only move on because, you know, we've got Halloween is coming. And then, of course, Halloween also means the start of the holidays where we will get a lot more use out of our cast iron because we've got Thanksgiving coming. And then after Thanksgiving, we've got that certain other holiday, only a little more than two months from now. <laughs> you will definitely need to uh, get your cast iron out and do some cooking then. And we will be ready for it because, you know, we've been doing this all our lives. They're going to like it. Well, I certainly hope so. We'll be baking cookies on cast. Nice. Friendsgiving. Definitely looking forward to it. But there we are, folks. Uh, the best I can say at this point, though, is thank you very much for being here on a Thursday night for doing this. Because 
Uh, again, Wednesday is usually the night that I do this, and I can only thank everybody for taking their time to do so. Uh, I've got a mess to clean up, but then that happens every time. And nonetheless, though, all of this really couldn't be done without you folks, because you folks are what really make this a lot of fun. And this is what I say every time, because it's, this is what I mean. It. I mean, the fact that uh, I got a chance to play with my uh, Stargazer, as well as the Field Skillet, and especially the Lodge Cast Iron Dutch Oven. So we are off to a, a decent, uh, we've had a decent time tonight, or at least I think so. But thank you very much for your comments, everybody. And especially, once again, thank you for being here, because I certainly mean this. As I said, I do this each week because it's a lot of fun. And you folks here are really what encouraged me to keep coming back week after week. And I certainly hope to keep doing so. I mean, I can only thank everybody who's been kind enough to uh, be here tonight. Uh, like C. Rums and hello, and Granny Graham. And Walking McKinney, I'm taking my Poiki Pot to winter camp this year. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm sure people will like seeing it as well as cooking with it. So, yeah. And thank you as well, Bell's Black Cat's Rules. Well, thank you for taking time out in your evening to be here. I, can, I mean, again, I can only thank everybody for that. Brian Roddy, it looks tasty and a great time with everyone. And thank you so much. And Corey Clark and the Big John. And I do my best to entertain you folks every week, so I can only thank you very much for your response, and I can only thank you again for being here. And everybody else as well, I can only thank you so much for, being, for your time tonight. And the best I can say, as always, is that we will do it again next week, where once again we have Cast Iron Wednesday. One more week yet before Halloween, so I, we'll have yet another dish next Wednesday. I might do pumpkin pie, but we will see what happens because I now have to consider making something from tasting history as well. Well, we'll work on that and we'll see how it all turns out. But right now, I can only thank you very much for your time this evening. And go and have fun, folks. I certainly have. So thank you once again. And as always, we'll see you all next Wednesday. Have a good evening. And a good night.